Hallelujah. Lord, we love you tonight. We love you tonight. We thank you for your presence. Thank you for the privilege of being in your house tonight. In Jesus' name. You may be seated. Lord bless you. Hallelujah. What a wonderful atmosphere of the Lord is here tonight. Amen. It's a very uh, sweet presence of the Lord in the house tonight. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. I want to say that if you're here and you have not received the Holy Spirit, you need a refreshing, a refilling of the Holy Spirit of the Lord. Tonight is a great opportunity for you to take advantage of that. Amen. I don't know about you, but I have to honestly admit to you that every time I come to the house of the Lord, I'm, I'm always in need of the, a touch from the Lord. I'm always wanting and desiring. Amen. The Lord to minister to me, to touch me in his presence. Amen. And so I think that tonight, I think tonight is an absolute opportunity for us to receive what we need from his presence. In Jesus' name. I'm going to ask my wife to minister. Amen. And she feels directed. Hallelujah. Amen. Well, I am here tonight to tell you that God is a miracle God. He has done so much in my life. But tonight I want to give him praise for his healing touch. In February, we were in Virginia, and I had some things begin to happen in my body. And I ended up in the hospital, or not in the hospital, I ended up in the emergency room. And uh, they said a few things, went to another, went to another um, area, ended back up in the emergency room. They had told me that there was some deep-rooted problems in my body. There was some cyst. There was something going on inside of me. And they made me promise that when I got to a certain area that I would um, go back to the doctor and get some testing done. So I did that a few weeks later. And God is a miraculous God. When we got the results back this past week, the doctor looked at me after doing a biopsy, and he said, I cannot see anything <laughs> that was on the first exam. <laughs> he said, I don't see what the other doctor has seen. It's not there. And I had taken all the reports, all the sonograms to him to look at. He said, there's nothing there. He said, there's no cancer anywhere. And he said, you know, your red blood cells, your white blood cells, he said, they're so low on the chart for where, you know, any danger or anything is. He said, there's nothing there. I said, well, then I can say God has healed me. And you know what? I am thankful for that. He is a healer. He is here to touch you. He is here to refresh you. No matter where you're at in your walk with God, he wants to touch you tonight. Holy Spirit, rain. Down, rain down, oh, comforter and friend, how we need your touch again. If you know it, just sing, Holy Spirit, rain down. change our heart as we stand on your word holy spirit rain down oh if that's your prayer sing it holy spirit rain down rain How we need your touch again, Holy 
Spirit, Holy Spirit, I ask you, Lord, to rain down, rain down, oh, let your power fall, let your voice be heard, come and change us. to rain down Holy Spirit Jesus Jesus, Jesus in the name of Jesus Jesus Oh, Jesus Jesus, Jesus Hallelujah. Hallelujah. 
Oh. Hallelujah, hallelujah, oh. hallelujah. Jesus, we love you. Jesus, we love you. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Hallelujah. Hallelujah, hallelujah. In the name of the Lord. 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 May be seated. Amen. Hallelujah. In the twelfth chapter of Matthew, between verses seventeen and twenty-one, the Lord there's a declaration made about Christ. It's actually a prophetic statement about his ministry. Right at the big middle of that. Four verses there, five verses. There's a comment that's made, and it says that a bruised reed he will not break, and a smoking flax he will not quench. And it's talking about how that what Jesus has come to our lives or to this world to do is not to tear down, not to destroy, but to go to whatever situation is evident in our lives and to build it up, to restore it, to make it better, to make it whole. Thank you. The concept of the bruised reed is a very, it's very simplistic. And Jesus Christ, when he when he ministered the word of the Lord in the New Testament, he always he always talked to the people in in common language, things that could be easily understood. He used illustrations that were very commonplace illustrations to people of that day so that they could get a mind picture, if you please, of what was going on. A reed in that day and age was a very common type of, uh, of vegetation. It was uh, uh, similar to the reeds that we would see in the marshy areas uh, uh, that might be down, probably not right in this area, but maybe in the lakes area and some of the um, pond areas around perhaps. It was a type of plant that would grow up and uh, would have a little stalk to it, but one of the characteristics of a reed, like some other plants, is the fact that once it got bent, once, once uh, an animal trampled on it or, or a chariot wheel rolled over it or someone stepped on it or whatever, and it got bent, that, that green stalk would all of a sudden develop a purplish, bluish, tent right where it was bent and it would look just like a bruise and Jesus makes this declaration concerning himself in the prophetic word he said a bruised reed he will not break and you think how commonplace uh, you know a, a piece of vegetation could be in those areas and what he was making a statement concerning was the, the commonplace of humanity. That how that humanity is all around, that, that we're everywhere, that, 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 that humanity is everywhere you turn. There are people that are hurting. There are people that are in need. 
And so instead of just ignoring that little bruised reed or, or, or paying no significance uh, to it whatsoever, or even maybe just taking a sickle or whatever and just breaking it on off, uh, the Bible says that the nature of Jesus Christ is that he would go to a bruised reed in essence, and he would basically bend down, if you please, and, 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 and take that little bruised reed that's been over and, and lift that little, little reed up and, uh, and, and bind it as much perhaps as he could and, and see if he could not allow man, that bruising on that little bent reed to be healed. That's not to say, amen, in the scripture here that Jesus Christ went around taking care of all the horticulture needs of every bruised reed, amen, in Israel. But the comment made here is, is, is prophetic. It's talking about humanity. And it's talking about the fact that Jesus Christ, that every bent situation, every bruised situation in our life, every situation that we deal with where someone is hurting, where that someone, amen, due to may, maybe an excessive load or, 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 or an abuse situation that's come into their life has bent them over and has bruised them very severely. And though someone that deals with horticulture may, he may go to a plant and, and, and pull off the dead leaves or pull off a, I, I've been around people that raise roses and they would go and I'd literally pull off the, the, the petals of some roses, a uh, man that had kind of got a little bit uh, shriveled up or a man had kind of uh, de deteriorated through some sort of outward source or whatever. But the declaration here is that Jesus Christ uh, will go to that little bruised reed uh, and that instead of breaking it off, instead of saying, well, well, there, there's a whole lot more bruised reeds. Uh, there's other reeds around. Uh, instead of saying, well, well, this is just one among millions. Uh, it's, it, there's not any significance to it whatsoever when you count how many are, are still out there. But the common is that to every single individual, to every human soul, Jesus Christ makes a an effortful reach to heal, to mend, to correct, to bring hope instead of ignoring, instead of passing it by, instead of forgetting it. Now here we are sitting in this church in this particular area and I know you've got a lot of people around this area but when you take into consideration the scope that North America with 360 million people in it only accounts for about 6% of the world's population and that 94% of the world's population is outside the borders of North America. And then all of a sudden you take into account that, that, that the world right at, uh, right at the end of December of this last year, just a little over six months ago, had just tilted over the 7 billion soul mark on the face of this earth. And though we cannot even fathom that number to speak of in any respect, but yet we find here a declarative statement about Christ that all 7 billion People mean something to him. And though sometimes in our humanity we hear about uh, the, the, the tragic events of, uh, of tsunamis and earthquakes and, and raging fires and avalanches and, and tornadoes and everything else that happens not only in our country but around the world and the numbers become astronomical after a while, amen, where sometimes it starts with several hundred and then it goes to 500 and then to 10,000 and then to 20,000 and even upwards to 30 and 40 and 50,000 and more that lose their life and we cannot hardly fathom that. But yet the declaration from the word of God still declares that every single person 
on the face of this earth that the nature of God is that he will do everything in his ability to not let us be destroyed. And he goes on a little bit further. And perhaps to those that were not real common with horticulture, he goes to that very common thing called the smoking flax. Now, flax was another piece of, of plant. The difference between it was that flax, and, and you perhaps have seen this in, in different vegetation and plants, were that when you would begin to uh, break or take a piece of flax, you could kind of strip it apart, and after a little bit, it would almost kind of have a stringy look to it. We've all heard of flax seed and all that kind of stuff. You go to that actual plant and, and you see that smoldering flax, that little piece of flax. And what they did in 2,000 years ago, they would take this little bit of flax and they would dry it out and it would come like a wick. And they would take it down in the little, and set it down in a little earthen clay lamps, if you please. And it would begin to soak up the oil in that lamp and much like a wick in a kerosene lantern would do today. And when it would come up to the end, top of that, it meant you would light that and that would be the light in the house. Got to realize they couldn't turn, flip on switches. No one took lighters or matches and lit anything. There was a real diligent effort, amen, in sticking a piece of flax in a little piece of, little little container of, of oil, a little clay and clay vessel of oil, and catching it on fire. But I remember something being raised by my grandparents. I, I, I'm not old. Well, I'm getting older. I'm 53, but, but I was just raised by old people. And uh, I remember being raised by my grandparents. I remember my grandmother ever so often taking all the kerosene lanterns. Coal oil is what they used to call it. To my grandmother, that was a cure-off for everything that ailed you. I could just cut myself on the nail outside playing and just be bleeding and come in the house and it, there was no need to go to the doctor or anything like that. It was just get down the kerosene lantern and take the coal oil and a wick and just put it across the, the sore and then watch me dance around in the, amen, in the hurting pain and uh, grandma would say, it'll be all right after a little bit. Sure enough, amen, it would be all right. But every once in a while, I'd light those kerosene lanterns for my grandmother, and she'd walk through the house, and she'd see one, and she'd say, you need to turn that one off, and you need to trim the wick because it's the fire's too high, and the smoke is too much, and it's clouding the inside of the globe of the kerosene lantern and it will deter the brightness of the light from being able to shine through. And So we would extinguish that little light and clean out that globe and trim that little wick and ignite it again and it would burn appropriately. But you would come to the end of the day and whether it would be a kerosene lantern or maybe a candle or whatever, there was always that little concept called snuffing out the candle. Now, they got little fancy little pewter snuffers and things like that nowadays, but where I was raised, it was like this. And I would have to say that some 2,000 years ago that that was probably the same concept that when they would go around the house and they would be putting out the fires out of the little burning candles, the burning lamps. It was. And so Jesus Christ pulls in a comment, and he said, a smoldering flax he will not quench. And though we don't necessarily see the significance of that kind of comment, I can see, amen, what Jesus is saying in the fact that He's saying that to any soul that has any desire in them at all, whether that desire may be as small as a little 
orange glowing ember left at the end of a wick, if you please. And there's no fire burning. There's no flame there. But there's just a little bit of orange glow and a little bit of smoldering, circling smoke. And where the normal person might come along and snuff it out. Jesus said that his nature concerning humanity was that he would not snuff out a smoldering flax. And when it come to humanity, what he was saying is that, Pastor, he would get down there where that little bitty orange glow was all that might be left. And he would... Blow wind, blow. Breathe on what's left of me. Until that little orange ember would all of a sudden be connected with that oxygen from my breath and it would begin to glow and glow and glow. And we've all done it to a campfire or, or to something at some point in time, perhaps, and where you would watch it and it would begin to come alive again. And in just a moment, if diligence was attached to it, it would, whoo, and a flame would come back up. That's the nature of Christ. That's the nature, that's the prophetic nature of Jesus that he never gives up. He never gives up. To the most insignificant, to the most minute, to the smallest individual, perhaps in their own eyes in the world, no matter how bruised they may be, no matter how smoldering their relationship with God may be, Jesus Christ comes along and he will not break off that bruised reed and he will not quench that smoldering little wick. Luke chapter 15 tells a, tells a, tells a great story about the nature of Jesus Christ. And it gives three illustrative statements. Some of it may be very common to it if, us, if not all of it. The first one is about the man that had the 100 sheep. And he began at the end of the day to count them as they would go into the fold. And my wife and I have ministered on the Navajo Reservation among the Indians for a year, oh, some 30 years ago. And I spent a lot of time with sheep herders that, I would watch them as they would bring their sheep into the corral in the evening time, and it was a curling corral, amen, and it would get smaller and smaller as you would go further into the little corral until it was small enough that each sheep had to pass through one at a time right into the end into an open area where they were pinned up for the night, and the shepherd would stand right there, and he would count them when they got down to that narrow opening where it was one at a time. And yet the Bible says, uh, amen, that what shepherd that doesn't have 100 sheep and he's counting them at the end of the day and all of a sudden 99 are there and one is missing. He goes out and he searches diligently until he finds that one little sheep that's missing. But the point there is not all, not all together the diligence of the shepherd to find the little sheep. It's also the fact how did the sheep get lost to begin with? Hanging around the sheep like I have in the past in some of those areas, I've noticed something. It's very common for them to put their head down and to begin to graze. And they're all in their little flock and they're grazing on the hillside. And they walk along and they graze here and they graze there. And maybe they go down to the brook area. When we were on that reservation, amen, 
as the as the winter would be progress, it would come down more into the uh, the valley areas, and as the summer would beat on, and the gra grass in the valleys and the areas there would kind of dry up, the sheep would go back up higher into the mountain elevations uh, where the grass was still green. And it's very easy for a little sheep to just be grazing along and, you know, just enjoying the grass and taking a drink from the brook. And if you're not careful, a little sheep can just kind of wander off away from the flock, not on purpose, but just by carelessness. Jesus Christ makes a declaration that some people just kind of wander themselves away from his safety because they just got preoccupied with life. I don't know who you are in this house tonight, and you know, from the glance. Amen, of just the human eye to the human eye. I get the impression, you know, everybody here is trying to live for God and do what they're supposed to. And, amen, there may be some here wanting the Holy Spirit and some, amen, that are making efforts. But I want to say this tonight, that sometimes just the cares of life get us a little preoccupied. And though we never intend on drifting away, we never intend on growing cold. We never intend on distancing ourselves from everybody else around us. But just preoccupation with our head down to the ground, going along, we wake up and look up and realize that we've distanced ourselves from the 99. They're way over there somewhere else. And we're all over here alone. And the second story is about the woman that had the coins in her house. And I relate to that story so well because I remember as a little boy, every time I'd get a quarter, I'd add it to my piggy bank. And then I would take my piggy bank out off the dresser and I'd go sit on my bed and take the little rubber stopper out of the bottom of it, shake it all out and I knew there was a dollar and a quarter in there, and I put another quarter, so I knew there was a dollar and a half, but I needed to count it all again. And so I'd take all my little change out uh, on the bed as I'd shake it out of the piggy bank, and I'd count it all again and put the rubber stopper back in and drop each one of them in the slot at the top of the piggy bank and wait for the next little batch to come along and so I could recount it. Somehow this woman, for whatever reason, she found the need to reach in and got her bag of coins and I think maybe perhaps in her house, maybe she just put them out on top of her table or something like that and shook her little bag of coins out. And one coin fell out on the table and rolled itself off of the table. And as Murphy's Law always declares, that quarter that you drop in front of the Coke machine always goes to the back of the Coke machine. That needed dime that you have to have to make that transaction come about always ends up falling and rolling across the linoleum floor and sliding up under that big, heavy pop machine just out of your finger's reach. And somehow this coin fell off the table, fell on the table, and rolled and fell off of the table and found itself somewhere hiding in that room. And the Bible says that the woman lost her coin in the house. And so she very diligently, I don't know what the denomination of the coin was. It doesn't give emphasis to that. I really don't think it really mattered because nothing was insignificant in that story. And she got her broom and she began to sweep in every corner and began to pick up the little table and pick up a, her little stool and whatever little meager pieces of furnishings that she may have had in that house. And the Bible said that she swept and she looked and hunted until she found the lost coin. And 
as silly as it may sound, I really don't think that coin meant to get separated from the bunch. I really don't think that coin purposely had a mind of its own to roll itself off the table and go hide itself in the very dark corner of the little house. But what happened is carelessness set in. See, the reason I would always empty my piggy bank on my bed is because my blanket on my bed would absorb any desire of the coin to roll. But somehow that woman apparently didn't empty it on her bed. And so through carelessness in the house, the coin got lost. And as much as I don't make a a, a stone throw of accusation against any of us anywhere, I will say that sometimes in the house, people get lost just through carelessness, sometimes on our part. And the last illustration, and if you'll come. is that wonderful illustration of the prodigal. And there's so many different directions you can go with that story. And there's so many beautiful messages I've heard about the prodigal. But the essence of the story is that one of the sons decided that he wanted to take his inheritance and he wanted to get his up front. And he wanted to take it and spend it on the, the scripture declares riotous living. In other words, doing what he wanted to do. Of course, the Bible has a happy ending to it to a degree with the fact that the Bible declares that after he'd spent everything he had and had wasted all of his inheritance, that he finally came back to his senses in the pig pen. He had a little husk in his mouth and little dirty pig slop in his mouth and all of a sudden he woke up and realized in his mind my goodness even the hired slave servants in my father's house are better off than I am and so he had a change of mind and he decided to come back to the house but I find in that story that I really think the reason that the prodigal left to begin with is the same reason that sometimes we find ourselves on the outs with God. And that's because we miscalculate the value of the farm. We miscalculate the value of Father's house, of staying put. Because the world and the devil combined have such an awesome way through billboards and media and every which way to give an impression that things are always better somewhere else. The grass is always greener on the other side and all of the things that as a child of God that we surrender or give up or never participate in to begin with, that if we would just add those things to our life, that our life would be whole and complete and so much better and we'd have big greater friends and everything would be wonderful. But sometimes when we are tricked by that little media story. It's all because we miscalculate the value of the house. As every head is bowed tonight and every eye is closed. Yeah. I don't know who you are in this house tonight. When we come to pray momentarily, you can 
You could not pray. But why would you not pray if, if there's any need at all in your life for God? Why would you not take opportunity to speak to him if there's any need at all for his presence? Would you stand with me all over the house? Thank you. Thank you for giving me your attention tonight.